All right, I'm, I'm going to try to hold it together this morning, eh? We are rejoicing, yes? We've got to welcome two new family members into our family in the last couple of weeks. Amen? I, I know the O'Neills like it quiet, but... So I went over last Sunday and welcomed Ryan to the family. But anyway, for those who don't know, she accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior and Dick... I can now call you brother, right? <laughs> Amen to that. Amen. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 and following. And as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. <coughs> We're going to stop there this morning. I had anticipated on going a little bit further, but, you know, just you get into it, you get into it, you just can't go past. If I could plant a thought in your head as we come to this passage, and I think it's all pretty familiar with us, this particular passage and this encounter that Jesus has. The cares of the world and the snare of wealth, and that is truly what Jesus is dealing with here, but there's something so much more, and there's, there's so much to this passage, and this part of the reason why I just couldn't move beyond here this morning. And Jesus is going to interact with his disciples in verses 23 and following in regards to this encounter that he has with this young man. But the episode ends at verse 22, for he was one who owned much property. Now, we could look at this and say, well, this doesn't have anything to do with us. You know, I'm obviously, I'm not wealthy, you're not wealthy, right? Unless we have some possessions we have hidden that no one else knows about. And we can sit there and say, this has nothing to do with us. And I'll just say to you, it has everything to do with all of us. But just let me set them things in perspective, because he is dealing up front primarily with the world and the snare of wealth, possessions, things that we own. Let me just sort of give you a little perspective. If we look at our life in comparison to other places around the world, we are extremely wealthy. Even if you take the poorest person in America, many of our, what we would consider to be poor, are more wealthy than people who live in other countries around the world. It's just a fact. And when you see folks who talk about being poor in America and they're walking around with cell phones, obviously they're not that poor, right? There are places far worse that have far worse circumstances than us. We can sit and think that I'm not wealthy, but if we look comparison to other places in the world, other slums in the world, what we have far outweighs what they have. The conditions that many have to live in are not very sanitary and not very sanitized. We would look at them and say, how could anyone survive? And even sometimes when we see people in these kind of conditions, we assume that there must be something wrong with their life. They should be able to get out of this condition. But that isn't necessarily so. And what's interesting that when we come to this passage, we will find that even we have a tendency to weigh someone's spiritual standing by how they look externally or by the things that they own. We can find ourselves guilty of the very same thing this rich young man is guilty of. And that's looking at the external things rather than at the internal. But when we sit and think that, you know what, I, I, I don't have a lot, I'm not very wealthy, I don't possess much, we need to think again in regards to the rest of this world. There are those that we support in this part of the world, missionaries, and this is an area in which they live and minister to other people. 
But we look at this and it sets things in perspective. And I wanted to do that because so oftentimes we can come to this passage and just sweep things aside and say, you know what? I'm not that wealthy. I'm going paycheck to paycheck. But guess what? That's pretty wealthy. And so this passage has everything to do with us. And we're reminded of the fact that we are on the way. We're on the way. Christ also sets the perspective for his disciples and for this young man, and Mark does so for his readers. But we begin the section starting in verse 17 through verse 22. We deal with the rich young man, and he becomes the focal point of this. Then Jesus is going to teach the disciples. There's an outgrowth of this encounter with this man. And the disciples are going to be amazed at what Jesus has to say. Notice with me verse 24, but the disciples were amazed at his words, But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, they were even more astonished. This means to strike out. They were knocked out of their senses. They were astonished. They were perplexed at the things that Jesus was saying. How can this be that it is going to be difficult for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? But see, the problem was is that they were viewing things from the world's perspective and from the society around them and the norms and the standards that they were surrounded by in the life that they had. But Jesus is going to take the opportunity to disorient them even more than he already has. And he is going to shake up their value system. And I pray this morning our value system is also shaken up. Because I guarantee you that there are things, as the rich young man, there are things that we hang on to that we should probably let go of. There is a threefold repetition of a phrase throughout this passage. Notice with me verse 23, to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 24, to enter the kingdom of God. And verse 25, to enter the kingdom of God. With this, Mark strikes the note. And he brings our attention to the relevance of the story of the rich young man. It sets the perspective. And this wider perspective sets the the understanding of the passage that, that is being dealt with here. Jesus is not merely just dealing with his attitude towards wealth. It's on a broader critique of the conventional values of the day, the conformists. These men were conformists. Go all the way back to chapter 9 and they're fighting over who is the greatest. That was something that was prevalent in society. They were always about who had the chief seats. It wasn't merely just chief seats in the synagogue, but also chief seats at dinner parties and all of these things and the greetings in the marketplaces. Those were all things that they reflected on in in Jewish society that this was going to carry over into the hereafter, that if you were looked upon and favored in this life, then you were going to be looked upon and favored in life after this. And even the more just will have a closer place to the throne of God than even the angels of God. So prestige was something that was important. It was a part of the convention of the day and the values of the day. We look at the issue of marriage, right, and the issue of divorce. There was no question about divorce. It was a matter of why. And Jesus says, no, you just don't do it. And the issue of children, you see, they're not accepted. They're they're not a part of society, not until they become older that they can contribute something to our life. And so therefore, they're not a part of the equation of the kingdom of God. See, all of these things were the conventions of the day. These men were conformists to the society around them. And even when it comes to the rich young men, they say, well, they're wealthy. Obviously, God blessed them. Obviously, they're doing spiritually well because they're prospering in the material things. Sometimes we find ourselves with the same perspective. Bob must be living right. Why? Because he has a great job. He looks healthy and fit. He's got a great car and a great wife, and he lives in a nice neighborhood. Right? We do this. We evaluate based upon the external, what one has. We even disguise our sinfulness by the things that we have. We can do this in our own lives. You see, if I live in a nice neighborhood and everything's clean and my house is all pristine and I've got the nice car and everything's in order and all of that stuff, see, I can disguise my guilt and sin. You see, everything else around me is clean, therefore I feel clean and I feel good about myself. This contributes to the overall re-education the disciples needed. And it was very specific and it was very uncomfortable. And Jesus was going to shake them up radically by this encounter. So I bring you to chapter 10, verses 17 through 22, the encounter with the rich young man. The setting comes in the first part of verse 17, and it says, As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus was setting out on his journey, 
And this is a present tense. It means that he was leaving the house where he had blessed the children. He is walking away from there. He is heading back out on the road again. He is going to head towards Jerusalem. And this is important because the repetition here of the way, again, is setting the context. And it is reminding us of something grave, but also something very thought-provoking. The cross looms ahead. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Verse 32 of chapter 10, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. And again he took them aside, and he began to tell them what was going to happen to him. And this is the third passion statement. The cross looms ahead. A very grave thing, a very serious thing, and something the disciples still didn't quite understand. But at the same time, I'll remind you that in all three passage statements, Jesus talks about the resurrection. He doesn't just dwell on the death, but he dwells on the resurrection that is going to come after that. Can I say then, if we look at this and understand the way is sort of illustrative of the way of the disciple, right? We are on the way. We are on a journey. It sets the context and sets the perspective. Use terms eschatological if you want, living with, the, with heaven in your heart, however you want to phrase it to yourself, to get the understanding of that is what we're dealing with here. It's living life focused on something other than the here and the now. This was the struggle that the rich young men had, because now I have to give up all of my possessions in this life for something that is to come later. And because he had so much, he found it difficult to let go of those things. It's a challenge for us to live with that perspective, to live with heaven in our heart, to live with an eschatological perspective. It wasn't just the cross. It was the resurrection. It was the newness of life. And we anticipate those things. But how easy it is for us to get rooted to this place. There's so many things that bind us down that we can't seem to let go of that hinder our walk and our journey on the way. We have the approach and the question of the young man comes in the last part of verse 17. It's interesting because the individual, the key figure of the story, is introduced simply by haste. In other words, there came one, a man, running and knelt before him. Other places were to told about his youth and were told about his status, that he was a certain ruler, but none of those things are indicated here in Mark's account. He doesn't dwell on those things, which helps us because he enables us more easily to apl apply this passage to our own lives without getting mixed up in all of the other elements. And the information that we need to know about his man is going to be unfolded by the story and the narrative that is laid before us. But the punchline comes at the end of verse 22, for he was one who owned much property. It's how it ends. It's how it ends. See, again, Mark makes it very easy for us to walk into the narrative, to walk into the encounter, to be a part of it, to experience it, and to walk out the other side, but with, with feeling the full effects of what was happening here. The approach of this man, he came to him running, he knelt before him, and he began questioning him, good teacher. This is an imperfect tense. He kept asking him about eternal life. In other words, this was something that was important to him, something that he really wanted to understand, something that he wanted to know. Having heard of Jesus' presence in the, in the, in the town, the city, he went to meet Jesus before he left the community. He had this pressing issue upon him, and he wanted to ask Jesus for guidance. His posture in kneeling before him reflects the fact that he was acknowledging the superiority and authority of Jesus as a spiritual guide. To see, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The combination of these statements shows the earnestness, the eagerness, the sense of seriousness, and the profound respect that this young man had. This is part of the reason why we find in verse 21, Jesus' response, he felt a love for him. This was not like some other individual that he had countered before that's mixed up in legalism, albeit misguided and so on. There was a sense of, of sincerity about this young man when he comes to ask this question. And it was a sincere question that's clear from Jesus' state, statement about Jesus having loved him. In other words, Jesus wasn't dealing with someone he had to un unmask his hypocrisy. He wasn't like the other Pharisees. There was a sincerity to his question and a sincerity to his pursuit. All guided, yes, albeit he was misguided, but at the same time, Jesus saw the zeal and the desire that was there and the sincerity of it, and therefore he responded with love. 
This question was not some question that was infrequent among the Jews. This was something that was often discussed for those who were thinking Jews. But he asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? If we look at the two terms, life and eternal, it's clear that we're talking about the ultimate salvation. If you go back to chapter 9, verses 42 through 48, we dealt with the issue of causing another to stumble, and we had references to the life, articular form, talking about the eternal life, and we have references to the kingdom of God, and clearly in that context in chapter 9, when we have those statements of the life and the kingdom of God found in parallel with hell, we're talking about the future aspect of salvation. I would suggest to you the difference between this passage in chapter 9 and chapter 10. The one in chapter 10 is we have someone who is working for salvation. In chapter 9, we have someone who's working out their salvation. But here, obviously, we have a young man who is pursuing eternal life. He has this burning question upon him. The man clearly believed in life after death, but also that it could not be taken for granted. But at the same time, when we look at this particular passage, when he asks the question, what do I do to inherit eternal life? This verb tells us that he viewed eternal life as something that could be achieved by doing something good. And so he comes to Jesus and he's asking him for some great exploit. Please point me in the right direction. Show me the thing that I must do so that I can possess this, that I can be sure of the eternal life upon the things that I've already achieved in my life. Everything about this young man screams the works righteousness, yes? He had, without a doubt, an understanding of the external form of the law and compliance to it. But he did not understand the inner spiritual nature of the law because had he understood this, his conscience would have been pricked and he would have understood his moral bankruptcy, but he didn't. He asked how he should do to secure eternal life, the blessings of the Messianic kingdom here and hereafter. And Jewish usage of inherit carries the idea of to come into possession of, to obtain. How can I earn this? How can I achieve this? And obviously he believed that he had the ability as well as the willingness to acquire whatever Jesus set before him to do. You see, I've already done all of these other things in my life. I've achieved this status before man, not before God. And so therefore, what else must I do to guarantee that I have this. The response that comes from Jesus is twofold in verses 18 and 19. First, Jesus is going to challenge the man's perception. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. I wish I could encounter people the way Jesus does. And the reality of it is, in one sense, we can if we depended upon the Holy Spirit as He depended upon the Holy Spirit to carry out His work and ministry upon earth. We would be able to respond to the objections and those who would come to us and, and, and deal with us in life. But it's interesting because what we might think is just a passing statement isn't. And He isn't trying to be sort of... Um, appeasing Jesus' ego, he sincerely made this reference to him as being a good teacher, but Jesus wants him to think about the words that were coming out of his mouth. Why do you call me good, he says, and clearly the stress is upon the reference to good. The man's perception of good was something measured by human achievement. How does he address Jesus? He addresses him as a human teacher. He obviously viewed Jesus as being someone who had achieved the status of goodness as a human being. Here was this great spiritual guide. Here is this teacher, this human teacher. And obviously he must have achieved this standing and he makes this evaluation of him. And he says that he is good. Jesus says, I want you to think about your words. Because understand this, there is none good but one and that is God. It's interesting because we, we do this. We, we talk about goodness, right? And sometimes, hey, my neighbor, he's a good guy, right? She's, she's a good individual. I mean, we use this term, but how do we understand this particular term? And obviously, Jesus is going to take it and elevate it to something far greater than what this man understood to be. He had a very imperfect standard by which he was evaluating others, and especially by how he was evaluating his life. 
No one is intrinsically good but God alone. He is the true source and standard of goodness. God is the only one who is perfect in morality. And therefore, He is the only source and standard for what we call good. It's interesting the words that we use in life, right? Awesome. That's an awesome sandwich. No, it's an awesome God. It's not an awesome sandwich, right? Good. Now we have the world who changes it around. You know, they use bad instead of good, right? Messing up our vocabulary. We just keep watering it down as we go along. The young man thought of goodness as a personal moral attainment. He regarded Jesus simply as one who had excelled in this attainment. He's a good teacher. He's a great spiritual guide. The man needed to see himself in the context of God's perfect character, and so Jesus points him in that direction. And this is not a denial of Jesus' deity. This is a veiled claim to his deity. The man unwittingly called him good, and he needed to perceive Jesus' true identity. If I can put it this way, if the young man called him good, and only God is good, did he accept the implication thus calling Jesus good? Right? Are you going to accept the very thing that you are saying of me? You know, what's fascinating is look at verse 20, when he refers to Jesus again, and he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things. No more good. No more good. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus then takes him a little bit further in verse 19 of chapter 10. And he says, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. He is going to answer this man by quoting the second table, what is called the second table of the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments. And what's interesting is all of these have to do with one's relationship with other human beings and other individuals. Right? This is probably the easiest way to, to verify the conduct in someone's life is by the relationship to other people. The first part may be a little bit more difficult, but this is a good way to judge one's character, one's way of life. Now, if some might notice if they understand and know the Ten Commandments, they realize that there is one that is missing. Thou shalt not covet. Jesus replaces it with do not fraud. Very fitting for someone who is wealthy, yes? taking the possessions that belong to another, and likely this is just the practical result of coveting. Jesus is going to make it very personal with this young man. What's fascinating is this young man's response in verse 20. He says to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. See, ever since I was considered a son of the law, I've done this, you see. But what's interesting is what you don't get from the English translation is this. He uses the middle voice here as Mark records it, and it literally is this. I have avoided, I have kept myself from. You say, well, what's the difference? The difference is simply this. It indicates that all these things here means not the commandments themselves, but the acts that they prohibit. I have kept myself from these things. I have not committed these sins. I've, I've been faithful to the law. And basically the man is claiming I have a clear conscience. The Apostle Paul could claim the same thing. And in Ephesians chapter 3, right, he said, according to the law, right, I was found. In man's eyes, by his legalism, blameless. There's no indication of insincerity in this statement. He truly believed that he had achieved and Jesus is going to show him, no, you have not. You fall far short. Because what's really important is the first part of the Decalogue, and that is your relationship to God. Yes? So Jesus is going to give him a twofold injunction, and he's going to call upon him to do several things. In verse 21, we have the first twofold duty to set forth by Jesus. And he says this to him in three verbs of command. Go, sell, and give. Go, sell all you possess, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. 
great perspective. I mean, Jesus takes the, the temporal things and says, I want you to surrender them and you will have treasure in heaven, eternal things, things that outweigh the here and the now. I want you to get rid of those things. I want you to give them away to the poor and I want you to come follow me. I mean, he's already declared that he is faultless in regards to his relationship to humanity. And then Jesus says, okay, I want you to take these things and benefit humanity by giving to the poor. And what does the man do? He's grieved. And ultimately, he walks away. Because he can't let go of these things. Jesus challenges him. He must tear himself loose from his earthly possessions and self-righteous achievements so that God will fill the place of supreme worth in his life. See, isn't this intriguing? The children, they come to Jesus. There are no hang-ups. They come helpless, dependent, receptive, trusting. The further you go in life, the more you're entangled and ensnared. Go back to chapter 4, right? The different soils. You're ensnared and entangled by the possessions and the things of this life, and they hinder you. But just stop and think for a minute, because there isn't just the issue of possession here. There are things in our lives that are hindering God from having supreme primacy in our life. What are those things? They may be values that we hold. Things that we think that are, are valid and we hold them so high even to the degree that we hold them above God Himself and they have more supremacy in our life than He does. It doesn't have to just be possessions. What is it that has the place of supreme worth in your life and my life? Maybe it's not things. Maybe it's people. Do you draw from other people the things that you ought to draw from God? Do you find in other people the things that you ought to find in God alone? What is it that hinders him from having supreme place in your life? And I ask myself the same question. What are those things that hang us up for us being completely dependent and reliant on God to walk in just complete trust in Him? He's calling for total dependence on God. I want you to let go of everything. See, now you're not going to have leftovers. It isn't, I want you to sell some and hang on a little bit for a rainy day. I want you to get rid of everything and follow me. And see, we alleviate and we, we, we appease ourselves and ease ourselves and we come to this passage and say, but it's just for Him. Yes and no. Right? I guarantee you, whatever we're hanging on to that we're not willing to let go of, God's going to ask for that. He is. He always does. I remember my, my cousin's wife, Becca, she committed to serving the Lord, and she was reading Romans 12, 1, you know, offering up your bodies as a living sacrifice, acceptable to God. And she said, Lord, I, I'm, I'm surrendering myself completely to you. This is, she's already saved, but she just affirmed that she is just surrendering herself to the Lord. But she said, Lord, whatever you do, I do not want to leave home and go on the mission field. And where did he take her? On the mission field. Stuck her out in the back of nowhere in Kenya, ministering to nomadic people living in a block hut. See what I'm saying? Whatever we hang on to, he's going to ask it from us. Because what he wants is total dependence. It's easy for kids. It's hard for us as grown-ups. The further along we get in life, the more things we have that entangle us and snare us. The harder it is for us to let go. I mean, even when it comes to the things of wealth and possessions. See, I need this. Watching, Les and I like watching this... Uh, Shows where they, you know, take homes and remodel them and stuff like that. And one of the shows we like watching is that they'll buy this rundown place and fix it up, right? And so the couple's going through and telling what they want. I've got to have two sinks in the bathroom. Really? Really? I've got to have a bathtub, jacuzzi tub, and I've got to have a shower. Yes, I have one of those. But I've got to have these things, right? 
I'll just tell you, I didn't design my bathroom, so that's, that's not mine. But you understand what I'm saying? We look at these things and we say, I have to. I need this. The problem is in America is we confuse want with need. We don't need. Most of the time, we want. And we call it need. There are so many things that keep us from, from being able to surrender ourselves up to God and go wherever He wants us to go. You see, I'll go there, God, so long as I don't have to give this up. Right? What is it? What is it that we cling to? The term, come follow me, it's present imperative. In other words, come and be following me. I want you to go with me on this journey. And Jesus invited him to a life of continued fellowship with him. He himself clearly being the way to eternal life. But it's interesting because Jesus is not just merely calling him to something that is purely in the far future. He is calling him to something to the immediate future. Follow me now on this journey, on the way. Join with me and my rest of my disciples as we head towards Jerusalem, as I head towards the cross. In other words, he wasn't merely just calling on him to renounce all of his possessions. He was calling him to a total change in lifestyle. See, I want you to live a radically different way. In other words, I want you to come join us. We're this itinerant band and we're heading towards Jerusalem and we have these common resources that we all use and we depend on other people to support us. Read Luke chapter 8 and the women that helped support Jesus and the 12 as they were journeying and ministering throughout the countryside. You see, I, I want you to leave everything. I want you to be totally dependent on God and I want you to live a life of dependence and reliance. This is tough to do. Not even when you have a lot. Even when you have a regular paycheck that just pays the bills, it's tough to do. And think about it. It's so easy that when you have those regular paychecks and you know they're going to come in, it's so easy to not be totally dependent and reliant on God. You always expect them. You go to your account first, right? You tally everything else up first before you go to God first whenever there's an emergency. God may provide that, but that just means then we have to work a lot harder to make sure that we don't rely on that and we completely depend on Him. The young man's response in verse 22. <laughs> but at these words, he was saddened. And he went away grieving, for he is one who owned much property. There's a rare word that Mark uses here, and it's translated he was saddened, or his face was downcast, can be translated. It's used in reference to an overcast sky. In other words, the expression of deep gloom clouded this young man's face. He went from great eagerness to feeling deep sorrow and disappointment, you see. Because he realized he couldn't let go and be dependent on God. W.G. Scrooge made this statement in regards to this passage. He said, he wanted God, but not at the cost of his gold. He wanted life but not at the expense of luxury. He was willing to serve, but not to sacrifice. Where are we with this? I lay in bed last night till 5 o'clock this morning asking myself these questions, right? Take gold out of it. I want God, but not at the cost of... Yes? I want life but not at the expense of luxury. And the luxury can be anything. Remember friends of ours were missionaries in one of the most impoverished areas in Africa. And when they came back to the States, she went to the grocery store for the first time, years since she had been. And she went in the grocery store and she started walking down the aisles and she just broke down and ran out of the store. She couldn't handle all the choices.
she got used to living with so little. She got used to living without the luxuries in life, right? I want God, but not the cost of. I want life, but not at the expense of luxury. We're willing to serve, but are we willing to sacrifice? You see, service is, is costs us out of something a little bit, right? But sacrifice, it asks for the whole thing, not just some of. What is it that hangs us up? from being completely dependent and reliant upon God. This encounter isn't just for the rich young man, it's for all of us, and especially for us who live in America. What are the things we cling to? Not just possessions, not just things. What about people? What is it that we hold on to and say, God, I'm willing to, but not this. Because it's that this that we need to let go of, yes? May God help us as we wrestle with these truths. And I tell you, when we understand the kingdom of God, it does turn everything upside down, and it ought to. And if it doesn't, then we're not seeing it properly. And Jesus is going to continue to challenge the disciples, and next week we'll come back and look at their responses. But how conformist are we to the world around us? How do we evaluate things? I mean, sometimes we we evaluate things by the world's standards, but we, we... Speak of it spiritually, yes? May God help us to understand these truths, and may our lives change because of it. Let's pray.